Hi, my name is Daniel Bell. This is Aftersoft. We're connecting with the culture that influenced our lives and engaging people along our journey to create community. Uh, my co-host today is Patrick Brennan, and uh, we have Matt Lambden, um, a former Green Beret with us today. Uh, What's up, Matt? You guys, how are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, I guess we'll just open up. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, your influences um, in in the military, what part of the soft community you come from, and uh, and then we'll get into what what you're doing right now as far as uh, the industry. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's awesome to meet you, Patrick. Uh, Daniel, you're still awesome, but. Hey, so I, uh, real quick, I uh, joined the Army in 2002, so I just graduated Arizona State in 2000, uh, September 11th happened, and that kicked me on to joining the x-ray program. So I was in one of the first few classes to go into the x-ray program. I was, we were laughing before the podcast because I was in the Q course so long, I actually got a good conduct medal. And so for those of you who don't know what the x-ray program is, it's a person who essentially it's like guy off the street or gal now um, and they raise their right hand and say, I want to be a Green Beret. And so, yep, I took the Pepsi challenge and it took me so long I got a good conduct medal. So I came in the Army in fall of 2002. Um, they actually closed the MEPS. My brother and I were going to join together and they closed the MEPS down in Phoenix for the Tillman brothers. So that was, that was pretty cool. So we got slipped. A little bit of time. Uh, ended up going doing the whole Q course. Uh, got to a team in January of '06. So yeah, it was a it was quite a process. And then I deployed about seven days later to Africa. Um, did I think I was trying to work it out? Uh, four deployments that first year to Africa. Um, stopped in Iraq for a little bit to pretend that I was a doctor and worked as a medic in the, in the tents of Balad, Iraq on some awesome, uh, worked with some awesome people and some terrible traumas, um, but earned my stripes as a medic for sure. Um, have probably 24 deployments, but that's, that's all the whole spectrum of a special forces career, uh, JSET, CNTs, PDP, SUS, and then five combat rotations, uh, all with 10th group. Um, I was blessed to have this, um, blessed career where I've been in 10 special force group for the last 17 years. Oh, that's great. awesome. Man. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so for myself being an x-ray, like, and I came a little bit after you, but, uh, I guess, you know, when you got to a team being an x-ray, right. It, it was one of those situations that was it a violation of a soft truth? You know, some folks probably welcomed you with open arms and others were trying to keep it arms distance. What was that like when you got to a team? Uh, they all hated my guts. Uh, <laughs> I, I, they're going to they're gonna watch this and laugh, uh, but they absolutely hated my guts just for me being like what I represented, right? Because most of them came from Ranger Regiment because that was what sort of the stepping stone for either going to a SMU or, which most of them did, or, you know, going to be a Green Beret, starting a Ranger Regiment, so going to the infantry, going to whatever. And so what I represented sort of, bypass that and shortcut. And so that it's safe to say they, they, they don't only hated me, they hated my face. Um, <laughs> however, you know, I had this mysterious skill. My senior <laughs> medic was this awesome dude. He's in the national guard now, but, and he said, what you have though is a mysterious skill that no one else really has or wants to know. And that's medicine. So he's like, Hey, 98% of the time as a special forces medic, you're useless. But on that 2% occasion, you better have your stuff wired tight. And so we're not looking for anything, because I didn't even know what the S1 meant. What, what is the S2? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's just like I had this steep learning curve, so I just shut my mouth. I wasn't married at the time, thank goodness. Um, so I slept in the team room and just got to know the Army. Uh, but more importantly, like I, I brought I, my A game with the medic part, and so – if nothing else, after the first year of several deployments, several JSETs down Africa, and my own little trip down to Balad, Iraq, like I, I earned the respect of the team. And I was, it took me a little longer than probably someone else with varied experience, but 
I think after the first year, I could say, hey, I belong here. Yeah, yeah. I had, I had a really strong senior medic when I got to a team, and you know, of course, you you come in with you know about six cases of beer, right? When you knock on the door, right? Just so they'll let you. Of course, they let the beer in first and then kick me out, and I had to <laughs> knock on the door again, right? But uh, but yeah, exactly that point, right? Where having that special skill set probably set me a little farther ahead than another you know Charlie or Echo or somebody else that came in through the X-ray program. They got ragged on a lot more than than the Deltas did. So I showed up in 06. Uh, there was a whole slew of folks that had already shown up before me, but they weren't medics. So I was, I think I was in the first x-ray medic class uh, that started in January 04. And so, you know, if I'd have been in, in the, uh, you know, the 18 Bravo correspondence course, I'd have been, a, I'd have been a group 18 months, two years before. Uh, Cause I did need some extra training in the medical course. <laughs> so delayed my arrival on a team. And so yeah, I recycled a, fa- a stupid portion of the 18 Delta course too. But yeah, nonetheless, I was, I was just happy to be there and, and, and shut my mouth. And, you know, like my father told me, he said, Hey, you know, like God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to do twice as much listening as you do talking. And so I utilized that on a team and it served me well. Yeah. I'm very cool. Yeah, I, I that that whole thing with the 18 series when when uh, I went to Sockham. So I, just to kind of bring this full circle of of how we know each other, you went through um, the first part of the Sockham or the 18 Delta uh, course with one of my friends from the 160th, uh, Joe King, and uh, we watched this whole X-ray thing happen. And you know, we had all been in the army. Uh, like Joe had jumped into Iraq and. And uh, I'm coming from the infantry, and and we're looking at this, and we're like, "What in the world? These guys are brand new to the army." Yeah, and they're letting them join special forces. Yeah, yeah the fact that you got a good conduct medal as an X-ray—that's uh, you were trying. <laughs> You're trying pretty hard. It's funny because I signed up. <laughs> uh, I left for October, but I was in the delayed entry program. So somewhere in the summertime, um, I'd actually signed up and received a twenty thousand dollars signing bonus. But I didn't receive it for three for three and a half more years because uh, I never made it to a unit. Uh, and then just like you said, hey, January 04, uh, alphabetically, the guy beside me was a guy named Joe King who just came from the 173rd of Vicenza, Italy. And their storied unit had jumped into Iraq, in northern Iraq. Like, And here's this guy when he looks to his left, who's essentially a college kid, right? Like I've been through some – tactics courses and some like a lot of rucking selection and basic training but that was the epitome of my career and here's guys from ranger regiment yep. and joe's from the 170 like some hard dudes that yeah like i admit i should have probably shut up a lot more in the 18th first when i first got there but <laughs> it all worked out and i'm still friends with everyone that's still in or or uh or still alive well, uh, yeah, and so that ultimately that's what we're putting this podcast together for is uh, we're talking about this, the people that come from our community, what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it. Um, you know, when it's uh, we talk a lot about transition, we hear transition all the time, and um, r- really we're drawing th- this this full circle from when we were in the military to what we're doing now, and so I'm I'm interested in. Like drawing from that, what you're trying to do right now, um, your your company's called 18 Series Bags, and what is your focus? What are you trying to build out from that? What what is 18 Series Bags about? Thanks. Yeah, I uh, well, I spent my whole adult life essentially um, in 10th group, and so I've become, you know, like a green beret. I can say that I could sit in most circles and keep up with everybody else but what I realized is over my career is you know like we identify select and then train the army's best so I can speak for you know the army but this this takes place within the whole SOCOM umbrella is we identify select and train you know the army's best put them through the Q course give them a green hat give them these crazy missions decentralized with no command and just like an initial mission statement, but then we give them commercial off the shelf equipment. And so we, we develop very little trust in most of our equipment, unless it's like on the lethality side, like weapon systems or vehicles, the FOSOV. 
And so, yeah, so the last couple of years I spent as the OIC, the of the force modernization shop for a group for 10th group. And what I realized was like the things that they, these guys were using to accomplish a mission were failing. Them. So we, we live and breathe SF guys and army guys, but SF guys live and breathe by sensitive items. And so if you don't have access to those sensitive items or you can't inventory them on a, on a regular basis, it's really challenging. And so after seeing this huge uh, gap in the market, yeah, my, my business partner and I, we created a, a purpose-built line of bags, load-carrying systems, rucksacks. Um, and what we did was, so in SF, you have, you know, your 18 Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, of Fox, you got a Zulu and an Alpha, and then everybody always wants to remember the, the real master of the team, the warrant officer. But <laughs> so you've got a weapons guy, an engineer, camo guy, a medic, and an intel guy. And so what we did was we created one bag maybe, well, maybe two bags per MOS on the team. So they're purpose built for that job, but they can be mixed and matched in a modular basis so that everybody can actually use the line of bags uh, more efficiently. Now, what we found was, what I found is the old rucksack that we all grew up with, with the external Alice frame, uh, and it's designed to break your back and knees. Well, what we realized was that it's like my wife's purse. Like she'll probably watch this, so I, I do love her very much, but her purse, once you put something into a purse, you know, you play that Wheel of Fortune Plinko game, right? Where that, that thing just goes down to the bottom of, of the bag. And you're like, hey, thanks bag. Like, thanks for screwing me over. I'm a medic. I really needed those, those drugs or that tourniquet. And so that's why you look at what we give guys and it's the Plinko bags of special forces that they, they have to dig their arm down to get that sensitive piece of equipment. And then even then, like, it's not expeditionary in nature you can't get it you can't see what you have and oh by the way when you need something you know just you know you got to give you got to give the wheel to jesus so for us all of our bags lay completely flat so it's a backpack that can be unzipped and it transforms into a backpack which allows you and then individual pockets within that allows you to see what you need to grab what you need and if you don't want to lay it down like i used to with all my bags you can lay it on the you can hang it. So that way people can walk by, they can get what they need. They can walk away. Uh, it's kind of a self-service, self-service for, for medics. Yeah. 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 And that's, I, I mean, that's key. I remember, uh, in the back of an aircraft, we, uh, we would always use the, the backpacks and I was like, how in the world am I supposed to do this with 20 Rangers around me? And I'm working on this guy. Um, uh, one of our PAs started using a fanny pack mm. And, uh, you know, so f- forever, we're always modifying the equipment we have. And it's I, like it is difficult to to find that specific thing that you need um, that, that serves the purpose for it, for the the for in your case, the Green Beret. And uh, I, I it sounds like that's what your specific focus has been on 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 that need um, to be able to adapt to whatever environment. Well, it's, it, it crosses domains, right? Because even though I call I used to call it the medic pack, but then guys would not want to buy it because it was just for medics, yeah. which is not true. I've actually, we, we changed it to the Delta bag because I've actually sold it to more EOD and canine guys mm. than I have medics because they also have gear that they need that's sensitive and they want to get it in an expeditious manner. And so what we did for the Delta bag, for example, is you know, in SF, God bless them, but the captain is generally the least trained person on the ODA. Mm-hmm. And so I've had some mass casualties where, you know, you wanted to get as much uh, medical aid, render as much aid as you wanted. But the problem is in my stupid little bag, you know, it was just made for these little sandwich clamps. So I couldn't give that medical equipment to other people without t- detracting from the treatment to this patient. And so in my Delta bag, I color coded all of our pouches so that I can say, hey, sir, get me the red one. And then the red one is for blood. The blue <laughs> one's for you know, oxygen or some kind of airway problem. I love that. Um, yeah, and so the same thing for canines. So canines bought the Delta bag and they put their Kongs in one and however they want to do it. Um, it's however they want to mix and match. But it's, I don't want to have, I don't want my bag to be the limiting factor as to you being the best you can be. What I want to do is have my bag amplify your awesomeness, but also give you options. Yeah. No, I, I, I love the, uh, 
the color coding for the officers. Color that, I mean, officers. that should probably be an SOP for, <laughs> for all equipment. So, I, hey, I've had nothing but phenomenal relationships with all my team leaders when I had them. Uh, and I always pick a fight with them because they're the easiest to sort of pick a fight with. But in the end, like, we want to make sure that they're a value, to add, you know, value added member to the team, right? Yeah. So, so this guy, <laughs> the- so this is my... This is my IFAC, so it's the fanny. So, but what I did was, what I did was I created um, this IFAC. Now for Delta, sure, you could use an IFAC. For our engineers or our breachers, you can put your breaching initiating charges in there, your crypto device, whatever it, you know it is. And I did this flap on top so that it actually go under your front flap of your body armor. So now you've actually got access. Because a lot of the times, what we found was a guy would take, you know, his IFAC, army issued IFAC, and he put it on his back behind his kidney, which you could never get if just on your own. And so you actually can't save your own life. Uh, something I learned at, at Halo School is you have to pull your own chute. And so that's under that premise, hey, be able to pull your own parachute, put your fanny pack in a place that you can help yourself. Because uh, the first thing, as Patrick knows, they teach you in the 18 Delta course is when, they, when somebody says medic, the first thing you should reply is, what? Because <laughs> you don't want to go to the place that that guy was just shot because you're going to get shot too. Yep. So allow him to, to save his own life. And then what we did was you could actually, if, if you don't want to put it under your front plate, you can actually route it through back here where, where it adheres. You can route it through your pistol belt. You can actually wear it as a traditional fanny right here. Mm-hmm. And then that's why we incorporated this Velcro because right here, it actually Velcros into the top of each one of our bags. So now if you wanted this as an IFAC, you could put it in the in our three-day bag. You could put it as a part of our Charlie loadout, loadout bag. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to make it modular just to amplify, you know, operators operating. So on, on that, since we're, we're, we're talking about um... – what you're creating that kind of the current event right now is, is uh, supply chain issues. Uh, is that, do you see that impacting the, the industry that you're working in and, and worldwide? Is there, are there problems with that? Like how, how are you navigating that as, as you move forward with the 18 series bags? Yeah. So as the new kid on the block in the bag industry, you know, it's once you get a supplier, you have to kind of, you know, massage that relationship to ensure that it doesn't leave without you. Uh, currently in America, like Velcro is at a premium right now, along with everything else that's inflated. Uh, Velcro's a bit of a premium product, so we, we had to make sure that we lean forward to secure that, you know, that that supply chain. Um, we have a really good relationship with our manufacturer. Uh, it's it's awkwardly good, so we're we're on a we're on a daily phone call, and so yeah, we're we're good. But for those people that haven't developed that relationship, and that was that was all based on our expertise. Like I'm. Sure, I have a business degree, but that didn't that didn't certainly cause my relationship with my supplier or manufacturer to be good. It's it's the fact that I grew up on a small team. Yeah. And and have relationships with people and, and he appreciates that back and forth mutually beneficial relationship as opposed to a transactional relationship where I'm like, Hey bro, what do you got? Yeah. Like that that just doesn't work and it's not long term. And I'm sure that if I had that behavior or attitude, it you know, he'd have moved on to the next retailer. Right. Yeah. Which, I mean, it sounds like just observing, like you've got a little head start, it seems like, right? Because you, you've probably been exposed to a lot of different business startups as part of the, you know, force mobilization shop. Um, plus, you, I mean, having a business degree, right, at least gives you some exposure early on. Um, I mean, as you guys launched this, did you have any help or... Where, did you get resources from anywhere? I mean, what, what was just... No. So, yeah. So, uh, nothing but um, Copenhagen and bravery. <laughs> so, we we literally had ideas, right? Like, you know, my business partner and I, we've both been in SF for almost two decades apiece. You know, we've, we're both uh, expeditionary in nature. So, jump and talks. You know, like, guys will want to move from location to location. But in the end, you got to put it back into my wife's purse to transport it to the next location. And then you got to miraculously have that stuff jump out. So 
having purpose-built bags decreases the, you know, increases the efficiency, decreasing the amount of time it takes you to get set up. Um, and, and so just like us setting up a business, uh, we just jumped into it. We said, hey, we know what the design, we know what we want and we know what we wish we had, more importantly. And so we just set out. Uh, so a quick analogy, uh, well, I guess a little story. Um, so 10th Group, which I was a part of, needed medical bags. And so I contacted a local retailer in Denver uh, and he manufactured his own bags. And I said, hey, I want to build a bag. And the medics in 10th Group are going to need it, want it, and we're going to buy it. And so I learned that whole process on you know, the cut and sew business, um, the marketing, the business of it, the fabric. It's, it's, it goes layer. It's like a layer cake. It's, it's quite deep. However, we built the bag. Uh, 10th Group bought a whole bunch of them. And now 10th Group 18 Deltas, as well as Enabler Medics, have, in my opinion, uh, a really, really, really good bag. Probably the second best bag on the market, simply behind my current bag. <laughs> um, I never made a dollar off it. I was clear about that. We, I made it strictly for our guys. But what I did do is I learned the entire process of cut and sew. And so by the time it was done, I was like, I could do that. I can put my ideas and my wants into an actual tangible product and make it a business. And so that's where we're at. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, you know, I think that's, um, it's unique to the 18 series. Uh, our friends who are over in Ukraine or have been over in Ukraine, um, figuring out how you source something locally. Yeah. Uh, you know, you take a look at the need and you're like, okay, this is the design. And, um, and you know what, it, it helps you understand, um, really what what you need to be successful and i don't i i think a lot of people have this reliance on whatever's available and they they don't stop and think hey we need to be able to source stuff to really get the next leg up on on what we're planning on doing rather than uh just relying on what's already there yeah. and you're like i couldn't agree with you more and i i won't speak to any other mos because i've really only had one maybe two but what i can tell you is like an sf guy you can send him to any part of the world, no matter what group, group immaterial, MOS immaterial, he's going to figure it out and he's going to figure out how to get stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the ingenuity of your average Green Beret. Like that's what they're identified uh, and selected for. And so if there's one big thing that I can, you know, at least pass on to this podcast, like, hey, we have so, we have so many intelligent Green Berets, Special Forces soldiers and they should not be intimidated to get into the business realm because they, they just are now have to shift from a military perspective to a, a business perspective. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I mean, I think that's great. And I, I think probably that the step that you had, right, of being able to build a bag and find a supplier and, and, and do that sort of stuff while you're still on active duty, right? Like that part of the transition – I think is important, right? Myself having been out for quite a while, like seeing that transition of mimicking somebody else's mistakes or, or learning from somebody else's mistakes or learn or making mistakes on somebody else's dollar, right? Like that's huge, uh, in being able to launch something on your own. Um, and we've got the skill sets, everybody's got the skill sets to do it. So just being able to spend a little bit of time being humble working for somebody else or, or learning from their mistakes, getting some mentorship, right? Um, someone like yourself having a 20 year career, um, how do you take a step back and be humble? And cause you're learning a new process, you're learning a new industry, right? Yeah. What are the risks? Like you're, you're stepping into that. Like, can, can you kind of go, go in depth when what you looked at and the, the risks that you calculated and you said, okay, this is worth it. This is worth my investment. And how how risky was it, or is it is it kind of a natural progression for um, for a Green Beret from going from a team to doing this? Well, I I think first it it starts with you know like hey no nobody really like maybe from a branding perspective we're off because maybe a lot of people don't know what eighteen series is, um, but the the challenge is right so a little bit of a branding issue. Um, I'm not. 
completely worried about that. Like I'm not, of course I'm not scared. I'm a green beret. Uh, that being said, I'll step into the unknown and say, all right, well, hey, let's jump into it. I think our biggest threat is while we build a brand, you know, we'll, we'll be copied, right? So we've already started seeing our one bag on another website. Uh, why do I know it's mine? Because he helped me build my first initial prototype. And so, eh, touche, my hat's off to him. Uh, and if you go to the website, it's the exact verbiage that I wrote. Uh, cause you know, these, <laughs> these, 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 these hands have a certain way of, of writing. And so I recognize my verbiage, but that being said, touche, well, well played. I guess the big thing for risk is like, Hey, as we establish a brand, uh, getting essentially ripped off by, you know, bag, bag manufacturers, cause there's nothing proprietary. There's just really good ideas, right? Like I could take the time to get a patent, mm -hmm. but it's not, I can't protect it. First of all, I don't have the resource to protect it, but also you put an extra pocket on and it's not, you know, the same bag. And so, you know, our good ideas, we don't use compression straps, right? Cause we, we have two, we have two compression straps. I don't use Molly on the outside of my rucksacks. For some reason, civilians love them some Molly and they also think that we like it. But I know that <laughs> two things, if you put something on the outside of your bag, A, it's probably not gonna show up to where you want cause it's either A, stolen or B, got ripped off, like physically taken. And so, no, it's got to be in the bag and secured. Yep. And so that's why we don't do any Molly. So as, you know, as our brand, you know, gets established and takes off, inevitably we're going to lose, you know, some of our sort of proprietary ideas to our competitors. Yeah. Well, I, but then, you know, to counter that too, right? I mean, there's not, I don't know, I don't know how many 18 series guys there are building bags specifically for that job, right? So you've got... A, the more you, you probably focus on educating people who you are, right, um, and dealing with those clients, they're going to want to buy your product just because for that reason alone, right? Well, I agree. I'm waiting to go to the first show where our one competitor that I won't say copied, I'll say took liberties with uh, our first prototype and now is selling it. But I can't wait to go to the trade show in an open forum with a bunch of people and be like, oh, so please tell me, tell me how you came up with this idea. Please tell me. Uh, <laughs> and just like, I don't know, be petty. But that's that's the biggest risk, I think. You know, we're in this weird time, in, too, in, in uh, this fiscal year because, uh, you know, we, we, a lot of money is getting diverted, rightfully so, right? A lot of money is getting diverted to the Ukraine. Units don't have a lot of the... Uh, money, the funding to spend on, you know, non-critical, but maybe critical non-lethal gear. And so it, it's just a weird timing for, you know, to start a business, maybe epically bad, just as bad as me building a house in the highest cost of lumber. I, I think I just have bad timing. Well, yeah. you say it's bad timing, but it, this is what's really interesting about you, Matt, is you have focused on networking and it's not Sure, it's connected to your brand, so people know 18 series bags. But what you've done, you've got your set rep that comes out every week, and you're highlighting different people from the soft community. I mean, it's been mostly SF, but then you highlighted the 160th, and then you did uh, our um, AFSOC, right? Um, and so we're like, you're reaching out and you're saying, hey, we need to be able to connect and take a look at at everything that everyone's doing. Um, you know, I, I'm in real estate. Patrick is, he does uh, mortgage in real estate. And you mentioned us and one of yours, uh, uh, one of your uh, sit reps, but you're doing that for people across the community. So uh, can you talk a little bit more towards uh, the, the need for that, for that networking and how it benefits everybody that is transitioning or has been out of the community for, for quite a while. Yeah, so it was, a. Um, I think I'm on 22 sit reps. The first 10, I think I kind of focused on my own growth, uh, my own challenges with uh, retiring, the transition, uh, starting a business, going to SHOT Show, um, it, and it was good. But then I realized like, well, I realized a couple of things. One, like, hey, Unless you're like my wife, you probably don't care uh, about, about how I'm going through this maybe struggle. And, you know, I have this interesting, you know, diverse 
group of people that get my sit rep just through email subscription. But more importantly, like I grew up in a small town, uh, 5,000 people. So I had seven uncles and aunts that lived in a single town up in Canada uh, of 5,000 people. And so, you know, we, we were actually a percentage of the population. But what I realized was like at a very early age is like those, I thrive in those small communities. And so that's why I spent the last 17 years in 10th group mm -hmm. uh, and like a prima donna only PCS twice. But, but more importantly, like in those small communities, you build long-term relationships and long-term relationships to me have always equaled trust. And once you have trust, like everything else is so quickly to get by. So trust to me is like an SOP, like a standard operating procedure. Like we all have a bare minimum common knowledge to all. And so we can move past having to explain the simple stuff and move on to the more important stuff. And that's, that's always why I felt special forces was awesome. Growing up in a small town, you develop that trust with people based on, you know, your long-term relationship. And, and so that's kind of the angle that I started looking at through other soft entities. So I did, you know, each group, three entrepreneurs per group. Um, and then moved, like you said, Daniel, to the 160th, and then our, our brothers over in the joint MARSOC. I have uh, Marine and Rangers. However, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe some people think it's weird or something. So I, I haven't had very good feedback from them. However, I'm going to put out a couple more about our joint brothers and sisters on our SOCOM. But the reason I did that was because, you know, a lot of the times in the military, the SF is really bad for it. If there's one thing that I would be mildly critical of, careful, which is transactional relationships, right? Like in the military, you learn that transactional relationships, and we don't even realize what they are, but what can Patrick do for me today? All right, Roger that. Hey, Patrick, I need you to do this. And then he moves out and does it, and that's great for me. So that was a, you know, in the military, we, we use rank or orders, right? Like we tell people what to do, but, but in the end, like, you know, here's, here's a good one. So in 07 in Afghanistan, an Intel person in another SF group drove through, through, through really bad lands to get to our commander to tell him so that he could give us the Intel so we could go crush that target. And so this Intel guy said to my commander, said, hey, here's the Intel. And my commander looked at me and goes, all right, what else you got? And kind of dismissed him. Because he was viewing it as a transactional relationship. There was, it was not mutually beneficial. It was simply one-sided on our part. We were looking for, you know, the, the proverbial trigger to, to have the, enough intel to go action this target. And so my commander dismissed him. Now, that commander is one of the best commanders I've ever had. But I realized then that the military gets us, sort of serves us wrong in terms of creating all relationships as if they're just transactional. But growing up in a small town, I could revert back to that. Or growing up on the same ODA or same battalion or group for the last almost two decades, like, I don't want transactional relationships. I want us to have a mutually beneficial relationship that we can all grow. Yeah. And, and frankly, I can, I can write about them in a way because I like to write. We can all grow. And it's, and it's a positive sum. It's not zero sum. It's positive sum. So rising tides lifts all shit kind of mentality. Uh, we can all get traction. We can all do well in the, in the afterlife, post-Army. Uh, and, and we can all grow. So that's, that's kind of the basis of why I was doing the sit rep. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a great summary of, of that process of thinking of, yeah, transaction relationships. I mean, tra transition is a big thing right now, right? There's a lot of nonprofits that are focusing on it. Uh, the drawdown from 20 years of war, right? Like everybody seems to be more focused on folks transitioning or that word, um, finding jobs or how to write a resume or how to, you know, convert that lingo from the military to civilian side. But um, I don't think there's enough emphasis on what you just said, like the ability to build a network. I mean, that is essentially a core component of an, of an SFODA, right? Mm -hmm. Is going to somewhere you're not familiar with and building a network. Um, but yet we don't really think of that in our personal or professional lives uh, in the same way. And, and that's, Ultimately, success outside of the military is going to be based on who you know, for the most part, or how competent you are, but primarily who you know and who knows how competent you are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, network is a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, Patrick, if I can add, that's, that's like transition. Like I went to TAP, 
And it's, it's a great, it's, you know, it's trying to do everything it can for a very diverse group of people with very different needs and wants. But, but that becomes like tap in itself is a transitional relationship. Like, Hey, tap, what do you have to offer me? I'm going to take it and move on. Mm-hmm. And so that's like, that's where I, so Daniel brought me up last uh, with Ed Richter, who I did go through the Q course with and Ed, I do miss your blue truck. <laughs> but you know, Daniel said I was skeptical <laughs> and, and in fairness, I get the, the wonderful opportunity to defend myself, but so thank you for, so thanks for having me on. But at SHOT Show, for example, so SHOT Show was an awesome success. Uh, I think we derived maybe like four retail sales, but there was four more than we had. But more importantly, like we got our name out, we had a good time and it was phenomenal. We met thousands, literally thousands of people. But some organization associated with special forces came by and it, and it made me a little nuts because here's two guys that are just throwing themselves out there, totally exposing themselves to everything, criticism, ridicule, uh, business. We're putting, you know, our own personal money against it. It's not like we're, you know, we're, we're two dudes from the army. So we've put all our designs out there for everybody to capture. And an organization came by who I kind of loosely knew just because I've been in SF for so long. And he asked me, he came to my booth and asked me why I wasn't a part of his organization. So he said, Hey, like you're an SF guy. Why aren't you a part of my organization? And I, so I, I took offense to it. It was really the, like I kicked two people out of my booth at Chacho. Show. One guy that was offensive towards our current president which I'm not going to deal with. So get out of my booth. And the other guy was him because he, he took it upon himself to come to on behalf of his organization, to come to my booth and ask me why I wasn't supporting him. And that's, that's a transactional relationship. Like he wants me to pay my dues in his organization that I don't, I don't necessarily know if I will. That being said, it would have been totally different had he come in and offered a mutually beneficial relationship as to how that organization could have helped me or my business and I could have helped them. And so that's, I think that was the most recent example that I didn't necessarily kick him out of my booth. I just, you know, like, why are you here? Is if this is just another transaction relationship, I'm not the army. So I'm not a military organization. I'm a private business trying to make a buck, like get out of here. And so that's, that's kind of where I did that because it's compound interest, right? Like I view, I view relationships and always have as compound interest. Like, Hey, if, you know, with my wife, we've been together for, you know, 16 years, like, you know, it just gets better and it really does. And that interest starts gaining its own interest. And that's with every relationship. Like we're not a fly by night organization and we're not a fly by night company. And so we're here to stay. So, hey, let's ingrain ourselves. Let's create long-term relationships with people that are mutually beneficial. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I've, I've had some similar experiences, right, as trying to establish myself in, you know, in the mortgage industry and, and wanting to be able to go out and say, hey, look, this is a skill set I've acquired. How, do, how can I help the regiment, right? And having some discussions along those lines, and it's, you know, it's like, well, it's pay to play, right? Like, you know, if you want access to this database, you know, here's the sponsorship list. It's like, well, okay, well, how, why can't I just offer a, you know, a, a financing class on, you know, how to buy a house or how to use the VA loan or things like that, right? How do you provide value? Even if I don't, I can't, there's only certain states I can work in, right? So it's, it's more of just an educational component. But yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I think, yeah, that transactional relationship is a real problem that we have. I think, some now here here's on the flip side so i wrote i've written about all five groups and uh, let's if i just use linkedin as sort of the the place i can get the best analytics from so on who reads it and i've had this phenomenal reach with this sit rep like just ridiculous numbers that i I never would imagine and then have a journal recently picked it up and so we've i've received some pretty awesome numbers from there too but just from linkedin so i can tell you that all the groups what the group's numbers are for the people that clicked on that photo and sometimes the photo it matters sometimes the caption the title matters but generally content's very similar right like i i just i love my own kind so i'm going to speak very highly of it and I, I think that comes across in the writing, but it's the non SF units, like one sixtieth. There were people that came out of the like woodwork to read it and to be like, "That's awesome," 
because I wasn't speaking about the pilots so much. I was talking about all the enablers that get the, you know, those birds up in the air, which is the majority of, of, uh, of one sixtieth. And so it's maybe skeptical because Green Berets are a little skeptical. I don't know. We're, we're taught not to like G2 everything because you need to earn your way onto a team. And so you got to make that guy earn it. And so, but I will tell you that like the Marsoc, the Air Force was huge. The 160th was my biggest. And so it's like, okay, maybe, maybe culturally we're a little, I guess, as Daniel said, skeptical. So maybe that, you know, in one podcast, I, well, the tech, <laughs> but, but I think it's good, right? Like it's, it's healthy. Hey, Roger that we'll, we'll keep fighting through it. And it doesn't matter. I love my own kind. I love the community that I've been in and I'll, I will continue to lead, you know, in, in, in the post army afterlife. Yeah, yeah. We, we are some grumpy, grumpy people. <laughs> yeah, especially the medics, it yeah. seems like. My wife will tell you that all day long. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I and and in that, I mean, going going back, we've had these conversations before, Matt, on the soft truths and how important they are to who – like we don't go around saying, "Hey, this is the these are the five soft truths," but we stop and we think about how it impacts the community we build, and so we want to go beyond that transactional um, experience that you've had in a lot of places, and and we want to offer. I, and ultimately, this that's what AfterSoft is about. That's what our podcast is about: is is saying, "Hey, let's come together. Let's talk about issues that are important to us." talk about the business that we're involved in and uh, talk about the the issues that impact our community and how we can we can move beyond that because we don't want to be that uh, stereotypical um, uh, VFW where we're sitting sitting here drinking complaining about everything we want we, we want to do that, beyond too, that. well I mean <laughs> that <laughs> I think you're right the, the problem like the, all those the Legion the VFW like they're all declining in numbers. And, and some of it is like, hey, there's guys out there with way more deployments than me. Yeah. And I, it is, it's 2022, like inflation's almost 10%, like, like housing rates are over six. Like I don't have time to sit around and drink eight ounce buds. Like I gotta, I gotta burn it down in my post army life. So I, hey, I very much appreciate what you guys are doing because you know, the truth is I, I don't have time to sit around and, and talk about, you know, combat and all that. Like, I don't have time for that. I, I have two, two kids that I'm trying to raise good humans. So I'm dealing with, you know, trying to be a father, a husband, you know, a, a you know, prior soldier, a businessman. And so I don't have time to sit around and drink 80 ounce beers. So really it's for me, I love what you guys are doing because you're trying to like figure this out. We're trying to figure out how do we band together as a network, as a community and help each other. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, and I, I definitely inspired by your sit rep over the, when did you start? Cause I think I started reading it. Uh, I think it was the third sit rep that you had published. It was at least by seven that I was reading somewhere between three and sevens when I started reading. Um, what, but when did you start that? Yeah. So I started, uh, just before shot show. So January this year. Yeah. So you've so been consistent. I a couple of weeks. I think I got a couple in prior to shot. And then I wrote during shot because it kept me out of trouble in Las Vegas. I <laughs> made it a lot easier. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and I just kept it up. So the challenge with writing about soft entrepreneurs is they have to respond in a timely manner. And so, <laughs> yeah, so I put feelers out, but I, I kind of put it against myself that I'd write weekly sit reps. It turns out that I can't keep up with that because I can't get the responses back in time to jam out like a well thought out crafted uh, sit rep. People don't but, send that back to you on time. Sadly, <laughs> Daniel. But I will tell you, uh, I, I still will write. You know, I'll still help them. I'll still promote them. I'll still drive. Try to drive traffic to what they're yeah. doing. Because you know, honestly, I, like I said, I, I love my community, and, and if I can help in any way. You know, I've written it a couple times, right? Like leadership doesn't end with a DD-214. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'll continue to lead in my post-Army life. Like I, I've led men in combat, probably the greatest professional career, uh, thing I've ever done. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just, I'll transition this to, to the civilian world and just continue doing it. Yeah. No, yeah. I love it. I think 
the sit rep is awesome. It's probably the, the few that you've done have, I don't want to shoot down other organizations, but I mean, it's the first time I've seen somebody actually write about multiple soft oriented businesses, uh, mm -hmm. and put it out there. Right. I mean, and that's not even what like you're a bag company and you're, yeah, you're yeah, focusing right. on, on your values. You aren't focusing right. necessarily on those yeah. specific products, but you're like, this is who we are. Yeah. Is the fourth truth will always remain true. Like we're all selling product, right? Whether it's, whether it's uh, bear solutions and fifth group where he's training law enforcement, you no, know, he's creating product or it's, or it's Jimmy um, up in Wisconsin. Who's from the one sixtieth, you know, selling medical supplies or, or, you know, Mikey and smoke bros selling, you know, seasoning, right? Like, no, no, no. It's humans are more important than hardware. Like we're all selling a product, but the, the product is a byproduct of the awesome human that created it. So humans are always more important than hardware. And so I, I've just always tried to live to that because it's easy to preach that truth, but you have to practice it and live it. So I'm, I'm just trying to live by that. That's all. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. What? Well, we consider that your 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 takeaway is uh, you know the four, the fourth soft truth, uh, uh, and and they are and so um, you know I thanks so much for uh, for bringing that that whole body of knowledge that career of knowledge uh, to us. Yeah. No. Thanks, Matt. Uh, you know, I'm sorry you didn't get to go to the gig pit in your 18 <laughs> X-ray days. You really missed out on some really fun times. Because I was, I was so, I was so mature as a soldier by then. <laughs> yeah, your good conduct medal. <laughs> hey, okay, so, two, so the two last things that I'll leave you with is uh, a, hey, Joe King had a mustard stain on his uniform in 2004 <laughs> wow. in the heart of 82nd Territory, and I hated being Joe King's friend because Big Sarge in 82nd always wanted to smoke Joe and whoever and the idiot with his hat on the back of his head with his hands in his pockets. Uh, so Joe was like a lightning rod for strikes from Big Sarge in 82nd. So that lots of friends from that. And the second, but Joe is like such a good dude that he, he could like come up with a fast quip. And back then I was probably a hundred pounds lighter. I could actually, I could run away fast enough. <laughs> so, so before you move to the second one, indulge me, tell the quick story about running. Into oh, the, oh it was terrible. <laughs> and I don't want to get Joe in trouble with, uh, Beretta. <laughs> However, we were at the uh, shop at, um, it's now transitioned into some like, I don't know, like there's like a Panera or something there now, but <laughs> it was the shop at that like sold the most Budweiser in like America. <laughs> and, remember like on the one yeah. Riley? That yeah. Right there. On Riley. Yep. Yeah. And it was like, you know, still just the shop at, it wasn't like this, like, you know, it's got like a mini mall <laughs> now, but we went in there. I don't remember when, but two E4s, both hands in the pockets, hands, the typical hat on the back of my head, you know, bebopping in, thinking about medicine, because we're all, like, trying to do the right thing, right? And so I go into the <laughs> shop bed. Um, I, I don't know what I need. I got something got out. And Joe was taking his time, as Joe does, because I love the guy. And <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm just standing outside, minding my own business. Big Sarge looks at me and he disregards me. He sees Joe come out, sees the little mustard stain on his jump wings. <sighs> so, so he turns and like the command hand comes out and he said, Hey, where are your orders for that mustard stain? And Joe didn't even miss a beat. Go, Joe goes, Hey, you got orders for that E6? I didn't think so. <laughs> and then some colorful words. I found came up. And Joe turned around and walked away. And I was just so dumbfounded. You could talk to somebody like that, Army. I just stood there. I was like, I don't. Uh, I turned around and just went straight. Away. That's Joe know, King. Was, yeah. But he was right, right? Like nobody's carried orders for the rewards. And but you know, in 2004, that was a weird time to have a mustard stain. <laughs> And it, what's funny is Joe went to the 160th, had a just a phenomenal career with those great Americans of the 160th, with you, Daniel, um, doing stuff that I can only dream of, right? Yeah. yeah. Then at SHOT Show, I was with, there for 10th group, and all of a sudden I was walking through all the firearms, and this dude came up and goes, Matt Liam, and gave me a big bear hug, and I go, Joe, what's up, dude? Like, it was, yeah. I haven't seen that guy since 2004. I think, but we picked it up like he's always been my best friend, and it turns out he is because we. I call the guy once a week, like I'm 
I'm so glad that we reconnected because he's just an awesome human, great American. And and I'm I'm jealous that Beretta has him because he's he could get picked up anywhere. So, yeah, he could sell it, anything. Yeah. Hey, so it, I guess the second thing that I'll end with is um hey, so I'm I was fighting for a while with organizations that help people and, and the transactional. So I, I was for about five years, I was the Green Beret Foundation's, like, not ambassador, but whatever. I was their LNO, their liaison to 10th group. So anybody that had an issue, um, they they came to me, and then I would seek the benevolent care through the GBF, who, who by the way, I got blown up in 2011, hospitalized in a spinal rehab hospital. Uh, they took care of me, right? And so I, I love the GBF, and I'm, I'm super loyal to those people. So they do great things. But when guys are like, hey, what can you do for me? It's that transactional relationship. So then I was like, okay, well, how do I help? So last year, I was fortunate enough, 2020, excuse me, two years ago, I was fortunate enough to go to Exos, right? So Exos is this uh, performance athlete place where guys go for us. We go to for physical rehab, but NFL players and all sorts of athletes go there for physical performance. Um, and it gave me my neck back. So in 2011, I got blown up in an IED, um, had some vertebrae in my, my, my neck bone, uh, broken, fractured. And so now I get st my sternocleidomastoids, which come on the side, get super stiff. And I, I can't even check my blind spot without turning my shoulders. And so I was lucky enough by an awesome group surgeon named Colonel Reesberg, who's now the SF uh, command surgeon. He and the Care Coalition blessed off on me going, which is a program that SOCOM already has. Mm -hmm. So I went to Pensacola, Florida for 30 days wonderful awesome people and so the program is conditioning in the morning strength in the afternoon there's a whole dietary plan and in the middle there's about an hour to hour and a half physical therapy and so that's that's just what the doctor needed right for my neck and so i got my neck back and when you get your neck back when, when that chronic pain goes away you can start working on some of the other things you've neglected in life and so hey you get in a little better shape your mind gets crisper hey, and you get back at it and so anyways the cost of exos ends up coming down on the unit so what so socom developed this program so that people could go there the challenge is is the cost the the flight the lodging the the uh, food is all falls on that 06 command each group commander and so my cost was about twelve thousand dollars to go to exos of which the commander rightfully so has to say hey I, i've either got to do this operation or get this kid or send this one guy to physical rehab. And so that's when I realized, hey, there's there's nothing focused to help offset that cost. And a lot of civilians will say, well, that guy should do that. The problem is we have over a thousand green berets. How do we, in one group, how do we take care of everyone? And so the, the need is really great because of all us, all us kind of dinosaurs that are moving on from GWAT dudes. So I just actually started the 18 series foundation and so I guess that's my, the long and the short of it. I started the 18 series foundation, a portion of all the proceeds um, are, excuse me, a portion of all the profit that I get from the 18 series bag company, I'll donate to the 18 series foundation. And the 18 series foundation is gonna take care of the lodging in Pensacola for all the SF guys that can go there. And so it's, it's a pipe dream, right? But I'm gonna work that pipe dream just like I did any other time. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm gonna buy lodging and try to create something similar to the Ronald McDonald house at every hospital. So if I can have a house or a condo or apartment in Pensacola, that will offset the cost by 50% for each group commander to send somebody there. Mm -hmm. And so, yep, that's my long-term goal. I remember when I was uh, at uh, the, the docks, that's what it was called when I was leaving the Q course. And I was sitting in the docks and this captain, I looked up and saw this plane flying. It was like an F-15 out of Pope Air Force Base. And I said, oh man, I'd love to do that. And he goes, oh, you're just gonna like tell me that you're gonna be a pilot? And I was like, well, yeah, three years ago, I was a civilian and I wanted to be a Green Gray and look at me, I just got a tab. I was an E4. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe uh, King's uh, influence uh, on you. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's just selling, oh, just dropped it. So, but what's funny is like, I put my mind towards it and I became a Green Gray. And then I put my mind over the last two decades at being you know, a great Green Gray. And maybe I, maybe I came up short, but now it's like, hey, I'll put my mind towards creating a bag business. I'm going to put my efforts towards creating a foundation to help other SF guys and just live to that humans are more important at heart. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're you've got a good jump start, man. I think the more that you build community with those sit reps, and you know, you probably get a lot of folks that want to help you with that foundation as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll have to have you back on and. Uh, uh, after everything's up and running and, and talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we'll make sure and include in the, um, uh, information, uh, your 18 series, uh, bad company and, uh, the foundation both. Well, so. Thanks brother. Yeah, Appreciate yeah you. definitely. It's been awesome talking to you, Matt. Hey, thanks. Yeah, Matt. Likewise. Yep. And, uh, I think I got to hop on a call with Joe King, uh, here shortly. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> he's looking forward to this podcast. Well, tell him I said hi. Um, if I'm going to try to interrupt your podcast on phone, so I'm sure he'll put me on speakerphone. I think what you guys are doing is the right thing. I think it's awesome. By the way, Daniel, uh, I was I um, I don't know if they contacted you, but some magazine called me or emailed me in regards to you. They thought I was in San Antonio, uh, but they're like, "Hey, we're up and comer." I was, like, I was like, well, I can lie to you and tell you I was in San Antonio, but I'm actually in Colorado Springs. But the dude I wrote about lives there. And so I, I, I spoke to you, uh, spoke highly of you and um, tried to get you, you know, hooked up with that magazine that wanted to do an article. But I think I appreciate what you're doing it. is awesome. So please keep it up. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Matt. Hey, appreciate thanks, it. Matt. Yeah. All right. Talk to you soon, man. Take care. All right. Appreciate it.